Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CISA. And our topic for today's webinar is Solar with Justice, Recommendations for Community Organizations. Before I pass it over to our guest speakers for today, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can connect via your telephone or via computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the webinar full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled there. You can also click on that arrow to minimize uh, or expand the webinar console, rather. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and your comments throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on the webinar console and hitting send. We will answer as many questions as we can. We're gonna save about 15 or 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A. So to make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end to display your questions. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording probably this afternoon uh, or by tomorrow. And this uh, recording and a PDF of the slides will also be posted on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I would like to pass this over to our host uh, for today's webinar, Nicole Hernandez-Hammer. Nicole is a project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and uh, she will be moderating the webinar. Nicole? Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have three great presentations for you today. In order to allow enough time for our speakers to present and for our audience to have plenty of time to ask questions, I'll share some quick introductions and then we'll jump right in. First, I'd like to introduce our organization, the Clean Energy States Alliance, CISA. We are a national nonprofit coalition of public agencies and organizations working together to advance clean energy. CISA members are mostly state agencies. You can see a list of our members on your screen now. This webinar is part of our Solar with Justice project. With funding from the Nathan Cummings Foundation, the Clean Energy States Alliance has worked with the Jackson State University Department of Urban and Regional Planning, the Partnership for Southern Equity, the University of Michigan School of Environment and Sustainability, and the Solutions Project to research and write a report on the solar landscape in under-resourced communities. The report, Solar with Justice, Strategies for Powering Up Under-Resourced Communities and Growing an Inclusive Solar Market, was released on December 10th, 2019. This webinar will present the findings and recommendations from this report that are especially relevant to community organizations and frontline energy equity leaders. To learn more about this and other CISA projects, please visit our website, cisa.org. So let's get to our presentations. I will introduce each speaker before they present. First up, we have Rudy Navarra. Rudy serves as Director of Investments at the Solutions Project, managing grant-making strategies to advance 100% clean energy for 100% of the people. Rudy also leads a national effort to organize philanthropy and increase investments in rural electric cooperatives. He also serves as a steering committee member at the 100% Network. Uh, follow him on social media on Twitter at Latino Sublime. We're happy you can join us today, Rudy. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, everybody, and and welcome. Um, I'm really happy to to, uh, uh, to be able to join you all on on behalf of the uh, Solutions Project and 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 uh, and and the Nathan Cummings Foundation as our, our partner, as 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 well as all the other authors and and uh, partner organizations in in this report. So I wanted to speak a little bit. Uh, uh, before our, the rest of our colleagues um, um, uh, speak to to the details of of, of this report and how uh, how it may be relevant to you all, just the uh, the um, genesis of of this report. Um, uh, it, the the, uh, the Solutions Project and and the uh, Nathan Cummings Foundation has have been partnering. Um, uh, for uh, 
for a number of years as 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 uh, as partners in philanthropy and 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 really trying to to uh, um, uh, to develop um, uh, just a a cl closer relationship with community partners and with advocates as a way to 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 uh, to not only influence others in philanthropy but 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 build uh, build closer partnerships across across a number of sectors and in in order to to ensure social change and as part of that work um, uh, uh, we 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 have a, as, as as our mission to to advance 100 clean renewable energy for 100 of of the people and and re really striving towards a, a a just transition towards towards a um, a, 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 a true regenerative economy and uh, Nathan Cummings Foundation also has um, their 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 clean clean inclusive clean inclusive economy program um, and as a way to to dig deeper into what was needed for for uh, not only resources and 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 I identifying gaps, we've we were the, over over the past um, uh, two years held a a, a number of of, of uh, actually convenings um, with advocates. Uh, the the first being around around actually community de determined and and uh, actually uh, co community owned uh, cl clean energy. And um, uh, uh, followed by by a number of other of, of other convenings. Um, uh, one was in New York, one was in Atlanta, one was in LA, and 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 really digging deep in terms of what what was needed around solar, around clean energy, around uh, around what it means to 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 have have uh, clean energy that's 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 uh, that's locally controlled or community. Be, Determined. At the same time, um, as 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 you'll see from a lot of the 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 recommendations in this project and um, and and the support, we wanted to be sensitive to to what were the uh, real obstacles and real challenges out there uh, to be able to present um, a a, a, um, a set of recommendations that 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 really spoke to uh, um, to to what what were the uh, the best practices um, and and um, case studies and, and 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 lessons and even steps for for all sorts of stakeholders um, uh, to to be able to to engage in this work and even as you're you'll you'll listen to 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 Warren and to others I speak to 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 the challenges of even um, uh, actually coming to an agreement on what what community solar actually means and and um, uh, how. How community and how other stakeholders see that that kind of work happening and, and unfolding, and so um, and so uh, um, just to speak on to to the next slide, please. Um, what what makes this report very uh, uh, very unique, I think, is um, that it speaks to uh, that we brought together a whole different set of stakeholders, and uh, that includes uh, you know from universities to uh, to philanthropy, to to business, to advocates, uh, to to clean energy de developers, and not only the, the folks that were were actually that were actually authoring the the report, but but really speaking to to a a, a wide cross section of 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 stakeholders through interviews and through and 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 through one-on-one -on -one engagement. To really bring forward a, a a number of recommendations that 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 speak to 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 the real challenges of what it is to to uh, to develop solar with a sense of justice and with a sense of um, uh, of a real real fairness, especially as we as we deal with with a lot of other challenges at at, at the uh, community level and as as uh, community members um, really. Uh, are tr trying to find a way to 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 do so with integrity and with and with and, and with as many options as possible um, to to achieve justice. And what finally, what I think what what makes this report most most powerful and most useful is that that um, uh, that that local community members and thought leaders across the country were were given particular weight and and attention in terms of how we 
how, how we reached out and how we listened to them. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited for, for you all to, uh, to, to learn more and to, and to listen uh, about but what, what we're able to, to actually learn from, from a lot of folks in the field and, and, and uh, bring forward this report for, for, uh, for everybody as, a, as an additional tool as we try to all together build, uh, build like pathways for, for, for clean energy and, and for solar with justice. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, back to Sam, so so she could further introduce other uh, other presenters. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rudy. Um, our next speaker is Chandra Farley. Chandra is director of the Just Energy Program for the Partnership for Southern Equity. She provides leadership, strategy, and coaching to ensure the program achieves its energy equity goals and optimizes its impact in the community. She works in partnership with environmental and equity organizations throughout the American South to engage diverse communities around issues of energy inequity, democracy, and climate justice. She was previously a program manager for South Face Energy Institute. Thank you for joining us today, Chandra. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, again, my name is Chandra Farley, and I represented um, Partnership for Southern Equity on the project team um, for this report. Uh, Partnership for Southern Equity um, is focused on promoting racial equity um, as the driver for shared prosperity for all um, in the growth of metropolitan Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and across the American South. Um, in addition to our just energy work, which is focused on energy equity and climate justice. We also focus on equitable development, uh, economic inclusion, health ec and health equity. So it was wonderful, again, to be a part of the report. And we were brought in, in particular, um, one of our regional coalitions that we refer to as the Advancing Equity and Opportunity Collaborative. Um, as an organization that was focused on um, energy justice and our ability to, uh, our ability to, and the report team's desire um, to make sure Southern organizations and um, some of the good things that are happening here um, had equal weighting, um, equal footing, as you know, a lot of our Bay Area, California, um, and, and Northern groups. <clears throat> So, um, next slide, please. Some of the um, work that we are about with Partnership for Southern Equity um, is really driven by um, this quote from our founder and chief equity officer, Nathaniel Smith, um, which is really about um, communities must be able to envision the change that they seek. And I felt really good about being a part of this process because it was encouraging to see that many of the values um, that specifically support communities being able to um, envision systems change um, and community wealth building, um, we were really able to uphold those and lead with those um, in practice throughout the development of the report. Um, the authentic engagement of the community participants um, was tangible. Uh, I think I have a photo here on the next slide of um, representing some of our community members and some that were a part of the report. Um, but the authentic engagement of the community participants um, was clear and tangible, and I continue to get feedback um, on the ownership many felt in supporting um, the success in the project from being included in the original convening that we hosted in January 2018, all the way through um, sort of a preview webinar that we hosted for the community partners um, just in advance of the release of the report. And they have some input onto the naming of the report. So it really was right and aligned um, with the values that we uphold with PSE and our work here in Atlanta and across the South is really about building the civic equity ecosystem and the ability to 
strengthen community pa- community capacity in particular um, areas like solar, um, like public service commissions or public utility commissions, um, because we truly believe that communities can speak for themselves. And when they have the knowledge and capacity um, to engage on all manner of issues, particularly related to energy equity um, and climate justice um, accelerators like solar, um, then communities will be much better off and we will move towards definitely the justice frame um, that we are striving towards across many areas. Some of the particular activities um, that that I was engaged in and was able to uh, sometimes even in the background um, coordinate with our equity ecosystem at PSE um, included, I mentioned just being able to recommend people to invite to that convening. So the names um, that I was able to recommend came directly from our Just Energy Circle. Um, which is our coalition work, just like the Advancing Equity and Opportunity Collaborative. And this is where we bring together technical experts, um, policy advocacy pros um, around the table with frontline grassroots community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, um, and even student groups around the table to really vision what more equitable and just energy and climate policy um, should look like. And um, I believe on the next slide there, I have our, just a snapshot of the values of our Just Energy Circle, um, which are very similar to um, the values that we lift up with our advancing equity and opportunity work. And again, I really felt like that, you know, things like believing community engagement is vital for the progression of self-sufficient people and neighborhoods. Um, this value and many of these, I think, are explicitly demonstrated um, in the final product of the report. Um, particularly, we had some really great discussion amongst the project team around, you know, what do we mean by underserved? Um, what do we mean by community empowerment? So I was able to um, work with the project team and um, particularly <clears throat> Tony Bream um, and Bernice Herbert um, from Alabama A&M at the time to really think that through. And that resulted in us actually having a call out section um, in the report to explicitly demonstrate what we meant by underserved. Um, so it was just a really, again, just a really great process. Um, we were able to review and provide high-level comments um, on the press release. We were a participant in um, interviewing and selecting um, the communications team um, for the report, which has done a great job. and. Um, now we're working on participant outreach. So the picture of our Just Energy Academy um, participants was from 2019. We will be um, kicking off our 2020 classes next month. And that is an example of the venues where we will be um, continuing to push the report and talk about the strategies um, and possibly implementing um, some of the strategies and having conversations about that in those community-based forums like our Just Energy Academy um, and ideally also at our Just Energy Summit, um, which happens every two years, which will be in Savannah, Georgia, October 1st through the 3rd. So we can really talk about what do some of these strategies look like on the ground um, so we can continually, you know, test and prove and, and refine all for the benefit of stronger, um, wealthier and healthier um, communities who we know are first um, and most impacted by inequities um, in the energy sector. And I will take a stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Our last speaker is Warren Leon. 
Warren is the executive director here at CISA. He has produced many reports for CISA, including returning champions, state clean energy leadership since 2015. Prior to working for CISA, he was director of the Massachusetts Renewable Energy Trust, executive director of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, and deputy director for programs at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I'll hand it over to you, Warren. Hey, thanks very much, Nicole. And what I'm going to do is focus in on the specific recommendations we made in the report aimed at community organizations and the roles that community organizations can play in advancing solar and under-resourced communities. On this slide, just by way of background, you see the list of all the authors of the report. And in case you haven't read the report, I wanted to very quickly just show you the report structure before I get into the recommendations. The report's divided into two parts. The first part is background, where we first talk about what are some of the challenges that under-resourced communities face and how can solar help those communities overcome those challenges and move forward. Uh, we then have another chapter that says, yes, solar can make a big difference, but it's not easy. There are a lot of obstacles to pursuing solar for under-resourced communities. Everything from financing challenges to the fact that it isn't necessarily easy to bring the benefits of solar to renters who don't control their own roofs to the fact that many uh, folks who have lower or moderate incomes live in housing that doesn't have roofs that are appropriate for solar. And then we had a chapter that um, Chandra alluded to, which talks about the importance of community empowerment and what we mean by that. So that's the first part of the report. The second part of the report is our recommendations. And we start with some general findings and recommendations, and then after that have a chapter aimed at a bunch of different groups. One chapter aimed at state governments, another chapter aimed at philanthropic foundations, um, we have a chapter that folks in great part at the solar industry and municipalities. And finally, we have a chapter aimed at community organizations. And that's what we're going to be talking about through the rest of this webinar. Here are our top 10 general findings and recommendations. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to refer to several of them that have special messages for community organizations and the role they can play. First, our first recommendation in the report, and this wasn't just for community organizations, but it's a message we were trying to get out to all the different groups, is that if you want to pursue solar in under-resourced communities, partnerships involving trusted community organizations are essential. State governments should be working with community organizations, Utilities should be working with community organizations. The solar industry should be working with community organizations. And we want community organizations to be aware that to the extent that we're pushing solar for under-resourced communities, we see them as playing a crucial role. Our third general recommendation was that installations for community institutions deserve special consideration. And there are several reasons for that. Um, and one to note, as Rudy mentioned earlier, we interviewed a lot of people in producing this report. And scattered through the report, we have excerpts from those interviews. And I just want to quote from one from Alana Matthews, who was public advisor for the California Energy Commission. And what she said is a good way to build support for solar is to think about which places are meaningful to people and involve those places in the solar economy. For example, when a church with 300 congregants installs solar panels on its roof, all 300 people benefit from it and feel that they are helping their community move towards clean energy. There are also other reasons for focusing on community institutions. One is solar can save money for those institutions 
leaving them more money for their essential public missions. And then on top of that, because of the fact that it can be difficult to advance solar in ways that particularly benefit renters, in, lots of folks who are renters still belong to and are served by community institutions. So to the extent to which those community institutions benefit financially, renters benefit indirectly. The fifth general recommendation is that financial risk needs to be minimized for LMI households and community organizations. This seems obvious, but can't be emphasized enough. By definition, folks with low or moderate incomes, LMI, have limited income. It means they don't have a lot of savings in the bank. And so if they have a financial downturn, they could be harmed. If a solar company comes into a wealthy community and says to someone who makes $200,000 a year, I have a deal for you. You're going to save, you have a 90% chance of saving $3,000 a year. You have a 10% chance of losing $500 a year. That sounds like a pretty good deal. 90% chance you're gonna save a lot of money. Well, in a low income community, that's an unacceptably high risk because if somebody loses $500 a year, even if there's only a 10% chance of it, they could suffer significant financial consequences. So solar has to be pursued in a way in which there's virtually no risk for the households and community organizations. And that leads to the next point here, which is that strong consumer protection is crucial. We can't be pursuing solar in a way that leads to folks running into bad actors in the solar market, bad information in the solar market, or bad actions in the solar market. And all the players in the solar ecosphere, from state governments to the solar industry, to utilities, to community organizations, all have an important role to play in addressing consumer protection and ensuring that consumers in under-resourced communities get good information, accurate information, and aren't put at unnecessary financial risk. And I'll come back to that. You could read the other general recommendations here, but I want to go on to our specific recommendations for um, under re for community organizations. And unfortunately, Sam, my slides are not advancing. There we go. Oh, let's go back. Thank you. So before I talk about this recommendation, I want to give you the context. We do not want to make unrealistic requests of small organizations that have limited resources. We know that most community groups do not have a lot of staff. They don't have a lot of funding. They're probably not going to be able to implement all of our recommendations. Instead, what we're doing is presenting a menu for groups to choose from as their resources and needs allow. I'm still not advancing, unfortunately. Sam, I'm going to just tell you to go to the next slide as we say then. Thanks. So we had eight recommendations for community organizations, and the first one is to insist on the involvement of community organizations. As we said in our First general recommendation, partnerships involving trusted community organizations are essential. Those groups understand the community. They could represent the interests of the community. They could win the trust and support of the community. And the solar development process is moving in a direction that engages community voices, that recognizes the importance of community voices, 
but those voices are still not always included. Community organizations should insist that community representatives and community organizations be included in project planning and implementation. If a solar company begins to market its services within a community and does that without involving community representatives, that company should be approached by community leaders and told that it needs to alter its marketing strategy. Next slide, please. Thank you. Our second recommendation is to develop an internal education plan. Community organizations can prepare themselves with information on energy issues and solar development so they can play an appropriate and effective role in advancing solar in their community. But before they figure out what education to get, they need to figure out what role they want to play. Are they going to be a project developer? Are they going to be a primary information source for members of the community? Are they going to be involved in workforce development and staff training? Are they going to be a conduit supporting the activities of another outside educational organization? Depending on what role an organization wants to play, you need to figure out how to get information so you could play that role effectively. Now, it's not always easy to get that information, and there are a lot of good sources out there, but we thought one place you could go to start looking for sources is the report we did, which is called Solar Information for Consumers. Now, it's really a guide for state governments on how they could put together materials, but if you go to that guide and you look to the resources we list there, you could see some websites and some reports and other things that we think have very good information for consumers about solar and they can be useful. A third recommendation is to engage the community in dialogue on solar. Those sorts of discussions that are entered into by a community organization with their constituents can reveal the issues that need to be addressed before solar projects could move forward. They can make sure that residents have the information they need to make sound decisions. One of our interviewees, Reverend Malcolm, Michael Malcolm of the People's Justice Council said, listening sessions where community residents can tell their stories are essential to effective long-lasting change. Grassroots community organizations can become a medium for amplifying those stories. They can explain what impacted communities need, and they can illustrate how solar can meet those needs. That's another thing a community organization can do is engage in dialogue. If we go to the next slide, I want to talk about our fourth recommendation and talk about this one at a little greater length. And this recommendation for community organizations is to control the decision-making process and make careful decisions about project ownership. There's been a lot of discussion within underrepresented and under-resourced communities about whether community organizations should own solar projects or not. That's uh, important, it's a controversial, it's a difficult, question, but the thing there should be no question about is the community should shape decisions and be able to ensure that there are adequate community benefits. Now, sometimes that can best be achieved by owning the project. And in our report, we have a case study from Push Buffalo about a major solar project they did in that city where Push Buffalo actually owns the project and did so effectively. But before everybody goes out there and tries to do the same thing in other communities, a community organization needs to do an honest self-assessment. Do they have the appetite and expertise to be a solar project developer? That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of expertise. Do they have the resources to withstand unexpected financial losses? 
because if you're going to own something, there's a chance you'll make money from owning it, but there's also a chance you'll lose money. So if we go to the next slide, a community organization needs to think about whether they want to go into ownership, but if they decide not to own up, go into ownership, they don't need to give up control. A well-structured contract can realize economic benefits without the risks of ownership. A community organization can initiate a project, control a project, and make the decisions about a solar installation project. And they could work with a third party entity that owns the system and takes responsibility for maintaining it. That third party entity can also qualify for the federal tax credit. Now, there's also a hybrid approach a community organization can take, and that is to bring a partner, bring in a partner with solar development expertise. And that partner then initially owns the project, but withdraws after five to 10 years when they receive their tax benefits. That then leaves the community group with ownership. And we have a case study of Uprose's Sunset Park Solar Project in Brooklyn that uses that hybrid approach. And that can be very effective. But if you're gonna pursue the hybrid approach, you need to make sure that is done in a way that doesn't delay the community receiving meaningful benefits. You don't want a situation where during those first five to 10 years, the community organization gets no financial benefit and all their financial benefits are backloaded until after the partner withdraws from the project. Well, in any case, um, one of our interviewees, Melanie Santiago Moja, of both Solar summarized the situation well. She said, stakeholders should try to create a process where communities know their options and can choose the one that's right for them. Ownership may or may not be right for them. It shouldn't be excluded or be the only route to empowerment. Communities on the front line should be in the driver's seat when it comes to making those types of decisions. Next slide, please. So we have some more recommendations. The fifth one is to push for community benefit agreements. That's a written explanation of how the community will benefit, what guarantees are in place to ensure that those benefits will materialize, and what happens if the project falls short of achieving its benefit goals. Um, possible benefits can include decision-making roles for community members, targets in terms of utility bill savings, job training requirements, stipulations about hiring from within the community, guarantees that electricity costs will not exceed the price of standard power, and assurances that current tenants will not be displaced or have their rents increased because of the development of a solar project. Those sorts of agreements will only become standard practice if frontline community organizations insist on them. In explaining the rationale for community benefit agreements, Adam Flint of the New York Energy Democracy Alliance stated, there should be a counterparty that looks out for the community and works with the private company that's developing solar. Our sixth um, recommendation is to identify key institutions and help them adopt solar. In my presentation, the slide about the general recommendation, I talked about the importance of installations for community institutions. Well, one role that community organizations can play is to help figure out which are the specific institutions in the community that would benefit the most from adopting solar and would provide the greatest educational benefit to the community, the greatest solar visibility within the community. You identify those institutions and then help figure out how to get solar for those institutions. If we could go to the next slide. So 
two final recommendations. One is to help the community avoid consumer protection problems. You know, I've made the case before as to why consumer protection is so important. Well, community organizations have an important role to play in consumer protection. They're not the only ones. State governments have to have good regulations and consumer protection remedies. The solar industry needs to participate, has, needs to make sure that its members are acting well and self-policing itself. But consumer community groups can do things like provide local residents with helpful information. You can figure out, is there a state or a municipal consumer solar guide that already exists that you could distribute within your community? In terms of thinking about consumer protection, give special attention to financing because a lot of the problems have to do with financing. Let me just take one example. Um, there are lease programs and power purchase agreement programs where a homeowner can get solar on their house and they don't have to pay any money up front because a third party owner is going to own it and they could start saving money right up front. That can sound very good, but sometimes those agreements include cost escalators of maybe three or four percent a year. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it could add up and what it can mean is that five years down the road, the homeowner is no longer saving money, they're actually losing money. So give special attention to education and information about financing. And there's another type of education that's necessary, not just education for local residents, it's for solar companies. Um, there are solar companies that are well-meaning, but may proceed in a way in a community that doesn't necessarily benefit the community members as much as possible because the solar companies may not exactly understand the needs of the community. So you could reach out to the solar companies as they're entering the community to make sure they understand the community's needs. And then deal with bad actors. If there's a company that ha is pursuing bad practices, they can be publicly shamed, they could be asked to desist, their practice can, can be put, brought to the attention of appropriate state regulators. And then our final recommendation is to take part in shaping policy. Now, a small community organization doesn't have a lot of resources for this. It can be difficult for that reason, but there are ways to do it efficiently and cost effectively. You can join a state or regional coalition and have your voice amplified in that way. You could request a, of a larger state or national organization that they keep you informed, tell you what's going on in terms of state policy. Ask them to tell you when your input could actually make a difference and could help shape what's going to happen. Sometimes even occasional phone calls and occasional letters can make a difference in terms of what happens at a state regulatory agency or in the state legislature or at the municipal level. If we can go to the next slide. And the last thing I just want to mention is that in our chapter on community organizations, there is more information than just what I've talked about. In addition to these recommendations, we have some short descriptions of successful initiatives and projects that can be replicated at the community level. And we have three case studies of projects that are community-led. One is the Push Buffalo Project which incorporates solar into a mixed-use project with community asset ownership. The second is Uprose's Sunset Park Solar Project, which created New York's first cooperatively owned shared solar project. And the third is Native Renewables, which is building um, energy independence for the Navajo Nation. 
And with that, let me turn it back to Nicole for questions. Thank you, Warren. We will now go into the question and answer portion of our webinar. Please continue to type in your questions for our panelists. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Our first question is for Chandra. How did you create buy-in with the community organizations? How did you frame the convenings as, quote, worth their time? Great question. Um, I think first and most importantly, as I mentioned, these were organizations and partners um, that we have been in relationship through our coalition building um, and community organizing work. Uh, <clears throat> So these were folks um, you know, that we've done work together in the past or, or collaborated with in the past um, through some shared um, values and, and goals and activities. And another you know, key piece of that conversation was honestly, hey, here's another report you know, that's getting ready to be developed. Here's an opportunity. Um, not just to represent the South um, also was, was an important um, piece is sometimes, um, you know, some of the Southern policies aren't as um, progressive, you know, a, across the region um, as other places. So that was, um, I think, an important factor is that here's an opportunity um, to for your organization um, to have a, a leadership role around input, around the development of the report. Um, and the third piece, I think, that came out of the convening um, once we got there um, was the um, continued engagement. Um, and I think we got clear that the need was really about what are the strategies, you know, that we can really implement. You know, there's lots of reports that come out, lots of case studies. Um, but what could possibly be deployed on the ground? Uh, and I think those three things um, in combination um, really helped us um, with, with our commitment. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Warren. Um, you mentioned financial risk, but not too much about incentives. Can you discuss the need for additional and or targeted incentives for LMI communities? Well, most of the most meaningful incentives are at the state level or the utility level or the local level. Um, some states have very good programs and um, special incentives for producing solar for under-resourced communities, and we talk about you know, some of the examples of that in the report. We have extended case studies of the work that's being done in Connecticut by the Connecticut Green Bank and in Oregon by Energy Trust of Oregon, and those programs involve special incentives. We also have shorter descriptions of other programs in places like Hawaii, Massachusetts, and California. Um, we hope that our report is going to stimulate additional states to offer similar programs with incentives. But basically, if you're a community organization and you want to figure out what incentives are available to you, you really need to look at the um, state and municipal level. There's no you know, national incentives that are easily focus specifically on low and moderate income solar. Our next question is for Chandra. Is the JEA program strictly for Georgia folks? If so, are there plans to expand to other parts of the South? Yeah, great question. So it was mostly Georgia um, as our meetings were uh, mostly in Atlanta, although we had our um, environmental justice session in Savannah, Georgia, where we have um, an organization, uh, an environmental organization um, as a partner, as well as one of our Just Energy organizers. And we also host a session in Fort Valley, Georgia, which is in central Georgia, where we also have 
um, two organizers working. So, um, but in that class, we did have participants from uh, Tennessee and Alabama. Um, Reverend Michael Malcolm has been mentioned a couple of times on this call um, with People's Justice Council was a participant. So yeah, we um, we would love um, love to expand and we'll be looking, you know, what does that really um, look like to do something in, you know, in partnership, you know, with, with one of our partners um, from the academy or, you know, from our other, you know, Advancing Equity and Opportunity Collaborative. So, um, so stay tuned. Our next question is for Rudy. You mentioned various meanings um, uh, on community solar. Can you talk a little bit more about what community solar means in different spaces? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and and one that, I mean, I, I'll invite my, my other speakers to, to also jump in, but, but one that, that, that we, we discussed at length between all authors in terms of, um, because there's a lot of different players in this space as as solar is being developed, and so whether it be utilities or, or uh, of course, of course, local community groups or um, or the actually uh, community choice aggregation in California, um, there's many different ways that folks are are engaging in their own definition of 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 community solar, and we. We talked about how how best to discuss it, and um, uh, and even considering other terms like like uh, locally de determined or 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 uh, actually uh, uh, community owned solar. Um, but then uh, realize that the part of the challenge of doing this work is that there are many there are many different actors and. And uh, and they're all kind of taking a different approach at this, right? And and a lot of the the challenges that that Warren uh, uh, spoke to, as well as 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 well as the opportunities, spoke to um, uh, what really does the community need and, and want, and and that, that 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 and instead of pursuing just a a a a uh, uh, a specific definition that 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 community members should really uh, focus on what type of solar they want, and and that 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 they determine then then based on 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 many of the the steps and the recommendations to ensure that they get what's most beneficial for them. Um, I I uh, don't know uh, Chandra or Warren or uh, or Nicole if you, if you want to speak to 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 this very good question. Well, Rudy, this is Warren. I think you framed that really well. The one thing I would like to say to folks on the line is in the report, we have a sort of extended sidebar on this topic of community solar, where we talk about the different definitions, different parties use, explain how they use them, and talk about this at a little greater length. The important thing to keep in mind is if you're using the term community solar, you need to be really sure that the person on the other end is using the term the same way as you are, because they may mean something very, very different by that term. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for, I think, two more questions. Um, so one of our audience members asks, regarding justice, one issue that has come up in discussion around solar in my under-resourced community is the production of solar panels in prisons that often hold many of our community members because of police repression and targeting of black indigenous people of color. Do you have resources or processes for identifying solar panels that are not produced through prison labor? And that can well, go to anyone. Uh, I don't know, Warren, if you want to take a first shot at that one. I don't. Um, and that's a very good question and probably something that requires additional um, 
research and um, additional writing about it. We do not address that in the report. And, you know, frankly, most of the solar panels that are being used at the moment are imported from Asia. And um, you know, one could think about the conditions under which they're being manufactured as well. Um, but that's something we probably should look into a little more and see if there has been any easy way to um, get an answer on that question. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I'm sorry, go ahead, Rudy. No, no, go ahead. She, did somebody else want to address that, that question? No, I was going to move on, but if you'd like to comment, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, this is Rudy from Solutions Project. Yeah, that's it. So, um, at, at, at Solutions Project, and just generally, I think that we were very conscious of, of kind of the extractive nature of, of, of the tools that were, were given to, to work with, right? And so, I, I think that, that generally speaking, as we, as we get smarter about, um, uh, taking steps toward towards a, a, a more more regenerative economy that we're we're able then to one have the awareness to to even ask the, the question of origin and extra resources and and where and where and where the the, the, the uh, resources are coming from in order to to be very conscious of what 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 not only the the impacts on, on the, the environment are but 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 equally or 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 even more importantly how how local communities are being affected and 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 sometimes they're they're um uh they're uh, the the challenges that that they need are even are 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 even worsened so um so there there's a lot more to do on that front and and i it, um it's even great to even have have someone ask that question so so thank you Okay, and so um, I'll ask uh, the last question. I'll ask each of our presenters to take a moment uh, to make some final remarks or any points that, that you'd like to make before we close the webinar. We'll start with you, Chandra. Just in closing comments? Yes, or any, any points or final remarks you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I really appreciate um, the questions and, you know, just again, participating um, with, with my colleagues. I really appreciate, um, you know, the solar panel sourcing question um, and the follow-up that Rudy provided. You know, I think these webinars um, are always great um, for learning that kind of um, new information. And I would just welcome um, folks if they're interesting and you know, following up with me on, on any questions. Um, I would love to, you know, get to know folks. Um, you can go to psequity.org. Uh, that is our website. <clears throat> and we are PS Equity Matters on Twitter. Um, my personal Twitter is Eco Nonprofit Pro. Um, so would love to hear from you and appreciate being able to participate today. Thank you. Um, Warren. Yes, uh, it was a great experience to work with Rudy, Chandra, and Nicole, and the other audience authors on this project. I think it really was a good team effort. And I think the final report has a lot of varied and detailed information recommendations, and I'd really encourage people to not just listen to this webinar, but go to the report itself. You don't have to read it from cover to cover, but if you go to it, it's organized in a way that you can get right to the parts that will be most useful to you. And as Chandra was saying, um, we'd really welcome your questions, your feedback, and your ideas about how we could continue to pursue work on this topic because we really do believe strongly that it's important to advance solar in ways that incorporate and advance justice and equity. 
Thank you, Warren. Rudy, any final remarks? Yeah, just uh, also, also to express gratitude and to say that 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 uh, the the work in this in this report was as 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 comprehensive as it is. It's also it's also a snapshot, um, and it's not static. I mean, the, the, these projects uh, uh, she keep on evolving in terms of the 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 uh, the uh, case studies, and there's and there's and there's a lot of lessons that continue to to be developed from them, and the and the recommendations are 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 also to to Chandra and to Warren's point of of of, of inviting folks to to provide their their thoughts. Uh, they 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 can they need to be further um, evolved and and improved as 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 things change by state and as as we uh, and and as uh, the the, the uh, political and policy landscapes to and and market forces to continue to change and i would also say that that there's a lot of other players out there that are doing amazing work um and and uh and and this report is 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 hopefully is hopefully building on their 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 great work as well and then finally um the report itself was part of a larger uh, bit of work that that um that the Nathan Cummings Foundation and, and that the uh, Solutions Project saw as a gap in in terms of how, um, of course, there were were uh, many audiences that, that that this report was meant to to uh, focus on. Um, uh, but 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 also one important one was was uh, uh, for uh, for both community members and 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 thought leaders, but but also folks in philanthropy. That uh, and 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 investors that 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 need to be further educated on on, on the great opportunities as well as challenges. Um, so that's all I'll add. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rudy, and thank you um, to our audience for your questions, and, and thank you to all of our presenters for joining us today. As Sam mentioned at the start of our webinar, this webinar has been recorded. You will receive the audio file within the next two days. It will also be available on our website. You can also visit our website to sign up for our newsletter to receive more information on our ongoing projects. You can also find us on Facebook and at Twitter at CISA underscore news. Our webinar schedule is on the screen now. Please visit our website to learn more about and register for our upcoming webinars. We will now conclude today's webinar, Solar with Justice Recommendations for Community Organizations. Thank you again to our speakers and to our audience for joining us today.